Welcome to the Economic Club of Chicago's annual discussion series, which is led by the Henry Crown Fellows of the Aspen Institute. I'm Ryan Ruskin. I'm a director of the club as well as a Henry Crown Fellow and one of your dinner discussion hosts for the evening. Uh, I hope you're in my room, although it can't be all of you. Um, this is the 17th year that the club has hosted this event, and tonight, as you all know, we are discussing Chairman Mao um, and is China's ascend ascendancy attributable to him or in spite of him? So now I'd like to introduce fellow member and tonight's host, Charlie Bobrinskoy, vice chairman and head of the investment group at Aerial Investments. Charlie has done an amazing job putting this program together for the past 16 years, and we are certain this year will be equally compelling. So now I'll turn things over to Charlie, who will give us a brief overview of tonight's subject, Mao Zedong. Charlie? Thank you, Ryan. All right. So this is the 16th of these uh, dinners that we've done uh, in 15 years. This is the first time we've done two in one year. We started with... Aristotle, what does it mean to live a good life? The second one was Plato, can uh, ethics be taught to the people that we lead? Uh, we then did Locke and Hobbes, two views of uh, moral character. Uh, and then we started running out of philosophers that I knew anything about. So we started to go into uh, more political leaders. We did Lincoln, uh, we did Ayn Rand. Uh, and then we did the best attended one of these ever was Alexander Hamilton, uh, which was overflow crowd. Um, so now we're, we're getting down to the point where uh, we've run out of people that I like. And so now we're going to start doing um, very important people, undeniably important people, uh, but not necessarily favorites of mine. And so um, I, the way I want to do this, and this is a little bit of an audible, is uh, if, you, if you saw in the video or in some of the readings, there was um, Deng Xiaoping, who followed Mao, after Mao's death, formed the resolution on certain questions in the history of our party committee. And he had a group of members of the CCP, the Communist, uh, Chinese Communist Party, um, get together and talk about Mao and where he was right and where he was wrong. And this committee actually came up with a recommendation and a resolution that Mao had been, get this, 70% right and 30% wrong. All right, we're going to start with some geography. Because we Americans are not good with geography. And it's very important in understanding Mao to know this geography. This in the right, upper right, is Manchuria. When the Japanese invaded, they invaded through Manchuria. This is Mongolia. When the Russians invaded, they invaded through Mongolia. Uh, this is Tibet. When the British invaded, they invaded through Tibet. This is the old Canton down here. When the British invaded the first time in the first Opium War, they, they uh, shelled all the main port cities, but mostly Canton. Obviously, this is Vietnam. When the French invaded, they invaded through Vietnam. When the, if you ask the Chinese, they would say when the Americans invaded, they invaded through South Korea. All right? So that just, this is Hunan district where uh, Mao was born. And then we'll talk about the, the Long March, which basically follows that path, OK? So, that, so if you ask uh, somebody who's Chinese, they would say China was invaded 10 times in the century of humiliation, lost all 10 wars. Uh, there were only seven countries that did it. British invaded twice. Britain invaded twice. The Russians invaded twice. Um, and the Japanese invaded twice. Okay. So here's the bull case for Mao. Mao was born into a century of humiliation. The country was completely ununited. Disunity was everywhere. Ten straight losing wars. Economic decline. China had been the number one economy in the world in the 15th century. By the time that the great uh, century of humiliation came, China was below 20th. Not only had they been defeated, but they had been dominated by foreign countries for 100 years. By the time of his death, China was a unified country and a great military power again. China today has the second largest economy in the world. It's the fastest growing economy. 750 million people have been dragged up out of poverty. That's not just a statement. The UN has an official poverty number, which is $1.80 a day. 750 million people are now above that level who were below it 
um, before uh, Mao took over. There have undeniably been dramatic improvements in healthcare, reading levels, education, and we're gonna talk about this a fair amount, the rights of women. And the bull case is that this just could not have happened without Mao. The Bayer case is, sorry, it's kind of faint, that China's development was despite Mao, not because of him. That all of this wonderful advancement in the economy that we all talk about today happened after his death. Think about where things were in 1976. Were we all worried about Chinese products and taking over technology? And we were worried about Japanese taking over uh, the world economy and taking over American companies. Nobody was worried about Chinese economic power in 1976. All this ascendancy has happened after his death. China's development was based on an embrace of capitalism, foreign investment of more than a trillion dollars into China, and urbanization. When we talk about it, Ariel, what did we miss about the Chinese stock market? It's mostly the urbanization, the move from the countryside to cities that was such a huge factor. And those were all things that Mao opposed. Everything that has caused China's ascendancy, Mao was very publicly against. His most important policies when he was in power were the Great Leap, the great leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, both of which were complete failures that even his greatest defenders don't defend today. They, they caused mass starvation, oppression, and cultural destruction. More, now this one will debate at dinner. I think this is true. Some of you may say I'm, I'm not counting right. More people died of unnatural causes under Mao than any leader in the last 200 years. So if you, we could talk about Hitler and if you gave him credit for all the blame for all the deaths in World War II, then maybe it's close. But I think Mao is the winner of this horrible prize. And there today is, and again, we can talk about this at dinner and see if you disagree with me, there's no country today that's emulating the policies of Mao Zedong, maybe with the exception of North Korea. If you want to come up with another example, we'll, we'll argue about that today. But that's pretty damning um, if nobody's following your policies. And I wanted to put this one on. It's a little bit politically incorrect. But if you ask me why I'm a never Trump Republican, a lot of it is because he's a vulgar, boorish man. And Mao was a vulgar, boorish man with four wives, two of them at the same time, 10 children uh, who used to, excuse my language, pass gas as loudly as he could in front of dignitaries. He was a vulgar, boorish man. All right. So those are the bull and bear cases. Now we'll start getting through into some of the facts. So he was born in 1893 in the Hunan province, which is southeastern China. His father was a very wealthy peasant who actually controlled other peasants. In Russian, we would have said he was a kulak. Uh, and some people think that this was where Ma was inspired in some ways to become a Marxist was by the example of his father uh, who was an upper-class peasant, who arranged Mao's first wedding at age 14. So uh, Mao was born during the time of the last Chinese dynasty, the Jing dynasty. By the way, I'm going to mispronounce some words tonight in a really horrific way. I've tried to get better, but this is going to be really not good. Uh, the Jing dynasty, which had been brought in by the Manchu uh, ethnic group from Manchuria in the 17th century when they defeated the Ming dynasty. He married, as I mentioned, four times. Uh, in the 30s, he was married to two different women, one of whom was being held prisoner by the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek and was ultimately executed by Chiang Kai-shek. He had at least 10 children. There are all these descriptions, if you read a book about Mao, about, and then they had their son who reached age four and was never heard from again. There are a lot of those in the history and family life of Mao Zedong. He died in 1976. He had been head of the People's Republic of China since 1949. Okay. So I thought the video that you all watched, hopefully watched, 
did a very good job of detailing when he came into power. I didn't think it did a great job of talking about the century of humiliation. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. Because really, if you want to understand why he is so revered in China, it's because he brought an end to a horrible hundred, of, hundred years of China called the century of humiliation. So we talked about military defeats, foreign domination. Um, it all started with the Opium Wars. And this is fascinating to me. Uh, England was importing so much tea, so much silk, and so much porcelain that they were running a massive trade deficit that they were having to finance with silver, and they were running out of silver. And uh, people in Queen Victoria's administration came up with the idea of paying for it with opium. They had massive amounts of opium in India, which they could produce for nothing, which then they were shipped to China to pay for all the tea in China. That's where that expression comes from. So, Queen Vic so the Chinese, after a while, saw what the opium was doing to their country. First, they tr started to restrict trade. Then they passed laws against it. Then they started locking up British opium dealers. And finally, they seized all the British opium. Queen Victoria declared war on behalf of free trade. It was really on behalf of selling opium to the Chinese. OK, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. There are 10 wars. The Chinese lose them all. And they are invaded by all of them. Uh, and we're just going to talk about some of the things that come out of this. They first lose the first opium war in 42. Uh, importantly, the, the British make them sign a treaty, extraterritoriality, which basically means that British subjects are not subject to Chinese law, even if they're in China. So a British agent who's in Shanghai who rapes a woman is not tried by a local court. He, he only has to be tried by uh, a, a, a British court, which you can imagine how the Chinese citizens felt about that. So then there's the Second Opium War, and this is where the French get involved, and they completely shell and sack the Summer Palace. If you go to China today and you go see the Summer Palace, they still have kept it uh, in shambles and shows how it was destroyed by the French, and they still carry that grudge to this day. They also made them form a Most Favored Nation Treaty. This is where this comes from. If you sign something with the Americans, if you sign something with the British, I'm sorry, with the French, you have to give that same thing to us. Imagine again if, if uh, you were put in that negotiating position as a leader of a country. So then um, the Russians get into the act and invade Manchuria and start, and Christian missionaries start coming in, particularly on the East Coast. Uh, then the French come in and, and conquer Vietnam and Indochina. And then uh, the Japanese come in and invade and take control of Korea. Part two of the century of humiliation. The Boxer Rebellion, this is a group, uh, I forget the actual name, it's um, the Righteous, um, hold on, no, I get the Righteous Fist, but it's a full Society of Harmonious Fists. Uh, and the, Amer the Americans took that and said, this is Chinese boxing. The martial arts is Chinese boxing. So they called these people the boxers. And these people were disgusted by the foreign intervention, by the non-applicability of Chinese law. And so they rebelled. And eight countries got together and, and put down the rebellion. Uh, the Russians, not happy with Mongolia, now invaded Manchuria. Uh, the British invaded Tibet. And the, the last dynasty, the Jing dynasty, fell in 1911. And a Chinese republic was formed. Uh, basically, I think it's fair to say the Chinese people were, felt that the dynasty was not doing enough to protect the country. And so there was a rebellion uh, led by the nationalists. Now, I'm going to call the nationalists the, the, uh, by the initials GMD. Sometimes you'll see that as KMT. Uh, it, some books do it both ways. The nationalists, these are the Chiang Kai-shek people, all right? So then the Japanese show up with 21 demands, including control of, of Manchuria, southern Mongolia, favored loan status. This is the beginning of the trouble with the Japanese, who will become their worst enemy over the next few years. At the end of the World War I, the J Chinese think that the German territories in China will be given back to them at the Treaty of Versailles. They give the German-controlled territories within China to the Japanese. In 31, uh, the, the Japanese invade Manchuria in full. 
Uh, the Soviets invade um, Xinjiang, which is a big territory, bigger than Texas, in western China. And the second uh, Japanese war breaks out in 37. So this is 10 different wars that the, Japan the Chinese lost, all 10. And this is the, what, uh, if you ask Chinese about the century of humiliation, just so you don't think that the Chinese invented this, this is a cartoon from a French political uh, magazine in which a member of the Jing Dynasty is looking on in horror as Queen Victoria, the Kaiser, Tsar Nicholas, the Emperor of Japan, and France all carve up China. So even in France, they acknowledge that this was going on. And this is from the magazine Puck, which is the American um, political magazine. And uh, I just wanted to read the quote. I am here to stay, Uncle Sam is saying, I am here to stay in China. And you can't divide this place up into spheres of influence without me. He doesn't say, stop meddling in China, mind your own business. He says, don't think you can cut this place up without me. OK, so uh, now we have the Chinese, Japanese, well, we start with the, the civil war between the nationalists, the GMD, versus the Chinese Communist Party, Chiang Kai-shek versus Mao. And this basically goes on from 32 to 49. So um, in 32, after the Remember, the Japanese have invaded in, in 31. Chiang Kai-shek decides that the communists, Mao, is even bigger threat than the Japanese. So he focuses all his attention on the communists. You saw this in the video. He massacres communists throughout China, but he takes his attention away from the Japanese. And he launches what is called the fourth extermination campaign against the communists. Mao has to go into hiding, basically, with his chief lieutenants. In 34, um, the Communist Party and Mao are, suffer a massive de defeat, and they are surrounded by the nationalists. There are about, I think there are, yeah, I said 90,000 of them surrounded. They break out and start the Long March, which lasts for 5,500 miles. It is 3,000 miles from San Francisco to New York, this is 5,500 miles in less than 18 months. When I first saw this, I thought this had to be exaggeration, you know, and this, this had to be not true propaganda. It is absolutely true. They covered this distance, and you can see pictures of where they started and where they end up. There were battles throughout the time. They were being fought by the nationalists. The communists won a lot of battles, but they were sort of survival battles. They arrive in Yunnan. And Mao becomes, at this point, the undisputed leader of the Communist Party. I compare this in some ways to Valley Forge. You, the defeated army shows up and is able to survive, but barely. This is a map of the 5,500-mile 5, march, which they did in less than 18 months. All right. Uh, quickly, um, the nationalists were led by Chiang Kai-shek, uh, which is, uh, they pronounced it the Guomindang. Some people, again, say that starts with a K, but it's the Guomindang Party, the Chinese Nationalist Party. Uh, it started basically in the, when they had the revolution against the dynasty in 1911. They were the dominant party until 1949. They were the dominant party that America supported throughout, uh, after, during World War II and after World War II. America supported the nationalists in Chiang Kai-shek. After they were defeated by the communists in 1949, he... America, uh, George Marshall, uh, Secretary of State, put him on a boat to Taiwan, where they are to this day. The nationalists really control Taiwan to this day uh, with American support. If you want to know why things are sensitive, this can sort of tell you why when Nancy Pelosi shows up in Taiwan, this is a sensitive topic. It's not just Nancy Pelosi, all politicians. All right, so, uh, so the second, to understand Chinese history, you just have to understand the severity of the second Chinese-Japanese war, which I didn't know much about, frankly. Um, so in 35, the nationalists again start focusing on fighting the communists. The Japanese take total advantage of this. They move out of Manchuria into northern China. They take over Shanghai. They take over... Um, uh, 
they take over Shanghai, they take over Nanking, uh, and very importantly, one of the nationalist generals kidnaps Chiang Kai-shek and says, you have got to stop this crazy policy of focusing on the communists. You have to focus on the Japanese. And so they form a united front between the communists and the nationalists to oppose the Japanese. The Japanese occupy Beijing, China, uh, Shanghai, and Nanking, and we get the massacre of Nanking. Uh, in the massacre of Nanking, which I had read a book about, uh, is one of the horrible periods of the Second World War, the three alls, burn all, loot all, kill all. The atrocities, again, you can think that some of this is propaganda. It was actively and positively followed within the Japanese press. I'm going to show you a couple of articles from the Japanese press at the time celebrating the slaughter. Generally, the Chinese population blamed the nationalists for focusing on the communists. And the communists grew significantly in power. This is a book I read probably 1997, which was a bestseller, The Rape of Nanking, and it details in detail the Japanese atrocities in Nanking. More than 100,000 people killed. This is an article in the Tokyo newspaper, and the headline reads, there was contests for what soldiers could kill the most Chinese with their swords. And this headline reads, incredible record in contest to cut down 100 people. Mukai, 106, Nada, 105, both lieutenants go into extra innings. So the, and there, you can see there's sabers here and the absolute um, celebration of this slaughter. Now I should say before this, the Chinese completely looked down on the Japanese who they thought of as an inferior race. They were smaller. They hadn't, didn't have the history uh, of the 15th century when China, remember, developed paper, developed uh, uh, gunpowder, was the largest seagoing country in the world. That's China in the 15th century. Japan, Japan never had that status. So the Chinese looked down on the Japanese, and the Japanese felt the same way and were just incredibly brutal in the rape of Nanking. OK, so uh, the United Front between the CCP and the, the Nationalists breaks down in the beginning of World War II. Pearl Harbor comes, Japan starts focusing on the US. Uh, the US actively supports the Nationalist Chiang Kai-shek as a way to put pressure on, uh, on the Japanese. Hiroshima comes and ends the war, including in the treaties on board the battleship, um, the Japanese agree to leave China, China. And the US attempts to negotiate a peace treaty between the Nationalists and uh, the communists, um, and again, this is George Marshall, who was Secretary of State, doing his best to try to negotiate a peace treaty. He is completely unsuccessful and symbolically and almost literally washes his hand of the China problem. There's a civil war for four years, which everybody in America expects the nationalists to win. They lose. And uh, for complicated reasons, maybe the nationalist forces are tired. Maybe they had lost the support of the people because of their um, inadequate opposition to the Japanese, the communists defeat the nationalists in a relatively short period of time, and Chiang is forced to flee to Taiwan. Uh, Mao declares the People's Republic of China. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. I thought that that was very important history because it's 100 years of humiliation, 100 years of slaughter, 100 years of occupation that comes to an end, and rightly or wrongly, many of the people uh, in China then and today credit Mao with bringing it to an end. Okay, so the Great Leap Forward was uh, the communists at the time in Russia, everybody had five-year plans. You'd get to the end of your four-year plans, which you obviously weren't gonna make your five-year plan, so you'd have a new five-year plan at the end of your four-year plan. The Great Leap Forward was the second five-year plan. It was intended to move China from an agrarian society to an industrial society, but to do it without urbanization, which is ridiculous. You can't have industry without factories, without workers, all of whom live close to each other, which becomes a town, okay? In, agrarian industrialization is pretty close to a contradiction in terms. It certainly didn't work. So private food production was completely made illegal, just like in Russia, they collectivized all the farms, they, they took all the land, the animals, uh, the equipment and collectivized it, just like in Russia, where the Ukraine went into famine, so too in China when they did this, the country went into famine. They put in backyard furnaces. I'm gonna show you a picture of a backyard furnace. At this time, Inland Steel and United States Steel had steel 
uh, Bessemer steel rigs that are 100 feet high that can be tilted to bring airflow into the steel to burn off the impurities. I'm going to show you a Chinese backyard furnace in just a second. So there was a, in order to meet the steel production quotas, the peasantry had to throw their tools into these backyard furnaces. So they would throw shovels and, and scythes and hoes and even tractor parts into the backyard furnace so that they could make shovels and hoes. The dumbest idea in history, and it didn't work. And so the food production plummeted and there were massive starvation. There's an estimate, and you know, this is hard to document because for a long time the Chinese would not even acknowledge. Mao passed a law saying that the word starvation was illegal. It was hard to know the exact number, but you can do roles of population, and there's been a lot of work done recently. The best estimates are 30 million people starving with no acknowledgement until 1980. Uh, finally, Mao cut off the Great Leap Forward. This is the basis of the Great Leap Forward in 1962, four years after the start. So here's the picture of the backyard furnaces. They're about 12 feet high. They're powered burning wood, which they didn't have enough of. You can't tilt them to get airflow, which you need in the Bessemer process. And they produce just steel, or not even steel, iron ingots that were worthless. So, and everybody had one. Every family had one of these things. It just, I'm sorry to sound so negative on this, but this is just madness, madness. All right, so eventually the Great Leap is acknowledged to be a terrible uh, disaster. Deng Xiaoping and Liao Xiaokui take control of the Communist Party. Mao is sort of, his policies are being reversed. He goes into, gives up a lot of power. He, he's still around, but you know, he's, he's an old man. And then he's effectively out of power. So this is Deng Xiaoping, and this is Liao Xiaokui. Um, Deng, when we were growing up, was the premier of China. So get to, I'll get to the bottom line. He survives. Uh, Liao is shot. So uh, Mao comes roaring back to power in, in, 60, in 66. He very symbolically swims in the Yangtze River to show that he's still vibrant. He warns of bourgeois influences within the party. He forms the Red Guard. He calls on students, mostly college students, but also high school students, to rebel against authority. One million Red Guard show up at Tiananmen Square. One million. The rejection of the four olds, old customs, old culture, old habits, and old ideas. I'll show you examples of that in a second. It's just horribly, horribly sad. Buddhist priests were forced to destroy their temples, burn statues, and a rebellion against all authority, mostly teachers, but professors, even party officials. Mao encourages uh, rejection of all authority. This is a poster, down with Liao Xiaokui, down with President Deng Xiaoping, hold high Mao Zedong thought. A woman, Red Guard, and we're going to talk about the women's movement here in a second, holding high the Red Book while the two Red Guard warriors humiliate the leaders of the Communist Party. This is a picture of a professor whose head's shaved, wearing a dunce cap. They would have beating meetings where these authority leaders were beaten on a regular basis. This is burning of the Buddhist statues. Just, uh, again, appalling stuff. All right, I want to, I've been pretty negative here for a while. I started with some positives, I think. But I do want to, one more thing which we're going to talk about as a positive is the role of women in China. Um, traditionally, if you go back to the Jing Dynasty, you know, we've all heard of bound feet, and probably some of us, again, thought that that was propaganda. It was not. Women, as particularly from higher parts of society, would have their feet broken, the bones broken and bound, so that the feet couldn't grow to more than five inches making it almost impossible for a woman to walk. Uh, they were uh, not allowed to study in schools, not allowed any kind of positions of authority. Arranged marriages were the rule. Divorce was impossible. Under Mao, that did change. And if you look at pictures from the Cultural Revolution, you see leading, women in leading roles, laws passed against arranged marriages, 
in favor of divorce, I think it's, I would say, undeniable that Mao was uh, a, at least a believer in women's rights and that it did show up. This is his wife, uh, Madame Mao, who in, in 79, after Mao's death, made a real bid for power to become the head of China. She lost that bid and she was ultimately tried for treason, but uh, she was a, a significant player. All right, so I, I referenced this early, and let me just, I'm going to lay this out. In 1981, Deng Xiaoping is reinstated. He had fled and had not been killed. His, his son was thrown from a building and paralyzed by the Red Guard, but he managed to escape and survived. And after uh, Mao's death, Deng Xiaoping was reinstated as premier, and he launched what I talked about, the resolution on certain questions in the history of our party. His verdict was that Mao was 70% correct and 30% wrong. Uh, he had to, Mao was the, the uh, embodiment of the legitimacy of the Communist Party, um, but all of his policies were being dismantled and repudiated, so you had to figure out what was going on. So they listed, and this is what I find so helpful for us, what they thought Mao was right about. And here is the list. National independence and unity, number one. We were a disunified, an ununited country. He united us. We became independent from foreign influence. We built a central government and strong army, which you can't survive on without. He just transformed social classes. We could debate that one. This one's nonsense in my view. Agricultural advances, total nonsense, but they listed that as a positive. Expansion of education and medical care, I think that's undeniable. And leadership of the third world is interesting. I haven't spent much time talking about this. Um, I would argue that they haven't become a leader of the third world, the non-Soviet, non-American world, but they felt that they were. So then they said errors, things that he got wrong, 30%. He got wrong, they said, when he became subjective or individual. When he stayed with the team and the collective, he was correct, but when he went off on his own, he got in trouble. The Great Leap saw setbacks. No mention of 20 to 30 million starving. Uh, they said you can't blame it all on Mao. They blamed uh, Qing Jing, which is Madame Mao's name, uh, Kang, Kang Xing, who was the head of the Secret Service, and Lin Blau, who was head of the People's Liberation Army. So they put blame on other people as well. And on, obviously they repudiated the attacks on intellectuals because that's, of course, what the leaders of the Communist Party were. Uh, and of course, dismantling the party was a terrible idea. So since Mao's death, his wife again, Madame Mao, t made an attempt to gain power. She was arrested and tried for treason. Deng, whom Mao had ousted, was rehabilitated, became head of the party. There's been massive economic success. It's just not deniable. Per capita income has tripled from 78 to 94. GDP has quadrupled on a real basis. 750 million people have been lifted out of poverty, as I mentioned, according to the UN official numbers. And again, this would be my argument, it's happened through the introduction of capitalism urbanization, international investment, all of which Mao fought his whole life. So that's the bear case, the bull case. You, I think it's pretty hard to deny either the bear case facts or the bull case facts. The question to me is how do you weigh these? And how do we as Americans see them differently as if we, as if we were Chinese? And how ultimately do we feel? Do we feel that China has gained its ascendancy because of Mao Zedong or despite him? And when you come back, we're going to have another vote and see based on all of this and you talk at dinner, where do you come out? Is he 50% right? 50% wrong? Where do you come out? Enjoy your dinners and I'll see you at 8 o'clock. Thank you.